Welcome to the G5 Hive and our next installment of our Worker Bee series, where we deep dive into the G5 college football landscape with the folks that know the teams the best. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening in podcast form, please rate and review. Today, we'll be taking a look at the Florida International Panthers, who finished 4-8 and eight last season. They wrapped up their 2024 spring practice with the spring game on April 13th. We have a special guest joining us today. He is a writer for Lemon City Live. He is a co-host of the official fan podcast of Florida International Athletics. He is Jake Gibson from the Pause Up Podcast. He can be found at Pause Up Podcast on X. Welcome to the show, Jake. Hi, Justice. Thanks for having me. It's it's fun to talk about FIU football as the season draws closer, as uh, college football 25 drops closer. That That's going to have a lot of hype to it, but... Uh, yeah, the vibes are high over in the 305 for the Panthers. And you're repping, uh, repping with that awesome, awesome jersey. We were talking a little bit about it. I mean, that was such an awesome jersey from last season. Definitely one of my favorites uh, from last season. Yeah, there were so many amazing uniforms just dropped all over the uh, FBS landscape. I know I believe the University of Houston dropped those Oilers, throw Oilers-esque uh, uniforms that were great, but so many people... Um, had nothing but great things to say about FIU's vice uniforms. The Panthers definitely rolled a seven. The overall uh, vice aesthetic that they uh, went they they went with. Absolutely, they did. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What led you to journalism and and covering uh, Florida International, and how long you've been doing it? Yeah, so I've been a sports fan my whole life uh, here in the 305, whether it be football, basketball, baseball, hockey. My South Florida just provides a bit of everything on the professional level. So when I went to college um, at FIU, uh, they they also had just about everything. They had college football, baseball, basketball, and soccer. So it was very it was very easy to fall in love with the FIU Panthers. And during my sophomore year at FIU, I became a um, a sports writer for Panther Now, the uh, student newspaper over at FIU. Um, a year later, I was promoted to the director of the of the um, of the newspaper for sports. And then once I graduated back in 22, I joined Lemon City Live, which covers um, all things South Florida sports. I, aside from the Panthers, I also covered the uh, the Florida Panthers, the hockey team, just won the Stanley Cup, the uh, Miami Dolphins of the NFL even the NASCAR races over at uh, Homestead Miami Speedway. But Kevin Kevin and I, Kevin Baral is is uh, the other host of the Pause Up podcast and a good friend of mine. He was also covering FIU athletics. He covered baseball and basketball. I covered football. And we thought, you know, there really isn't a whole lot of podcasts or just content in general from the fan perspective for FIU athletics. So if we started something like a podcast, uh, we wouldn't have any competition. I feel like it would take off immediately. So we did. That's when the Pause Up podcast was born back in late 22. And uh, we've we've just been popping off since then. We recently recorded our, our 66th episode of the show. We've had numerous guests um, from the world of FIU, whether uh, famous alumni like Billy Gill of the Dan Lebitard show, um, current and former athletes and coaches at FIU. We were even lucky enough to have the president of FIU, Dr. Kenneth Jessel, hop on the show for a little bit. So, um, no, it's been fun. Uh, the The podcast continues to get bigger and bigger, and and like I said, we all we're all set for this football season to start with some amazing content on our end. We feel confident in that, and uh, there's uh, there's just confidence about the Panthers this season. That's what and that's what makes it uh, very fun for us. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, kudos to you, man. Like, well, you know, the the G five does not get the uh, get the coverage it deserves, and right, it, and, and you know, folks like you are the go to places for these, uh, you know, G5 schools. So definitely, uh, definitely, definitely appreciate that. For those uh, not familiar with the Panthers' offensive style, how would you describe it? It's it's a pretty well-mixed um, conglomeration of pass and rush. Uh, last season was defined, some of the biggest plays of FIU's offense last season was designed towards the deep ball from – our quarterback, Kewan Jenkins, to wide receiver Chris Mitchell, among our other um, talented wide receivers from last season. Um, they they went towards that a lot. It didn't work out a lot, but when it did, it was exciting, and it really um, it really kicked things off for the Panthers. But they were a pre- they had a pretty consistent offense as far as passing and running. It was just a matter of finding the perfect play for the first and ten. And if you, if you get close to uh, the down marker, say it's second and two, third and one, then you'll bring out your running backs. But 
I wouldn't say the offense as far as schemes and play calling and all that was anything so special out of the line, but there were some games last season which proved that they were efficient, and that's obviously I think what matters the most. Their games last year against North Texas and UConn are probably the best examples of that with what they were able to do, especially under Kiwan Jenkins, who um, as a as a true freshman last year was put into the starting role after after the Week Zero game against Louisiana Tech when our former quarterback, Grayson James, only threw for four passing yards in the game. And uh, Grayson, he's a good guy. Uh, we had him on the show back in the day. He's now with Boston College. And the keys are now in Jenkins' hands to uh, to keep the to keep the offense going and become the leader that everyone, I think, wants him to be. Well, well speaking of quarterbacks, like you said, uh, last season starter Kiwan Jenkins is back. Uh, he took over in the second game of the season, like you mentioned. Um, and – you know, Grayson James only threw for four yards that first game, but they had, a, you know, the running game was going was pretty great. strong in that game against Louisiana Tech. Um, as, as you mentioned, James is now at Boston College. But how did uh, how did Jenkins look in the spring? Promising. He's bulked up, which is always nice to see. But more importantly, he now has that leadership mentality that he's wanted to hone in on. And the, the rest of the offense is rallying around that. Jenkins – I mean, he's a Miami guy, went to Miami Central High School, won a bunch of accolades there. Um, he's the quarterback on this team that fans have wanted to see uh, a, a school like FIU have for a while. This is one of the few years where we feel 100% confident about our quarterback situation, which which, which is tough for a lot of G5 teams. Yeah. But, no, Kiwan Jenkins is our guy. Uh, his play style is exciting. He can be a very accurate passer, not to mention really good a really good scrambler when the pocket collapses. And it's exciting to see how he'll develop to, uh, and the pressure that he'll take with being that leader. Obviously, FYU has a tough task in week one going um, on the road to Indiana to take on the Hoosiers. But still, um, we all have very high expectations for Kiwan Jenkins. Um, he was exciting last year, and I think I think he's he's only going to get better. He has. His ceiling is very high, um, and he has a very exciting skill set. Well, I, I can tell you, Luke and I will both be rooting for you guys week week one. We uh, we yeah. always want to see those G five upsets of those P four teams. Um, who do you think will be the number two quarterback behind Jenkins? Probably Hayden Carlson. Um, there there is a bit of a uh, a quarterback um, a war between a few of our guys between Carlson and Clayton Dees, Chaden Perry, among others, but. I feel, I feel like you have to give Carlson the nod just because he was also the QB2 of last year as well. He actually got snaps in games. There were unfortunately a few blowout losses for FIU towards the back end of the schedule that Aiden Carlson needed to step in to finish games. So I feel like you ought to give it to him, but hopefully we won't have that situation this season where we'll we'll need to see anyone but Kiwan or lights out, as we call him. <laughs> That's a great nickname. <laughs> oh, um, it, it's wonderful, yeah. Moving over to the running game, uh, this room is highlighted by the return of Shamari Lawrence and Kawan Owens. They combined for 94% of the running mm -hmm. back carries in 2023, but they also get Lexington Joseph back from injury. Yeah. How did that room look in the spring? Great. And it, 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 it was a bit confusing coming in because we were, it, we were very fortunate that both Kijan Owens and um, Shamari Lawrence returned and that they're suited up and will get be ready to play this season. But yeah, Lexington Joseph, we call him Flex. He is a beast. He was super good before he was sidelined with that injury that set him back all of last year. So you combine when you combine a really good, a, 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 I'd say a reliable running game that FIU had last season with a experienced veteran like Lexington Joseph, it's very exciting to see how that'll all develop come the start of this regular season. I still feel confident that Owens and Lawrence will get plenty of snap season. They, they earned the right to that because of how solid they both looked last year. But, yeah, I'm, I I myself am interested to see how many snaps Lexington uh, or Flex will get compared to the two young bucks that we have on this team that are, again, already reliable. But no matter how, no matter how you look at it, the running room will likely be improved compared to last season just because of that. Uh, now you have a three-headed monster and, and Flex, Owens, and Lawrence, and that's really exciting to see. Quarterback's best friend is a good running back that can that can secure the the third and twos, the the, the second and ones. It, it's exciting. Do how, how is uh, Joseph's recovery from the injury coming along? Is he is he going is it going well? Is he going to be ready uh, come week one? 
Come spring practices, he didn't get as many reps as some of the other players, but by this point, he's good to go. He's locked and loaded, and uh, yeah, uh, not really a whole lot much to say, but Lexington, uh, he should be good to go come week one. So you mentioned like you, you kind of expect it probably be like a three-headed kind of monster in terms of the running game. <clears throat> Do you think they have like defined roles? Like, hey, this guy is the short yardage and the goal line back. This guy is kind of the, the pass catcher or change of pace or – it's tough to say. I feel like you saw Owens quite a bit towards the goal line, and you saw players like Shamari Lawrence more towards. Uh, maybe every, maybe every now and then you'll get the draw play on first and ten just to just to see how, what the defense is coming with. You saw Lawrence for that, and then you saw Owens when it's gold when it's a goal to go situation. I feel like more than likely that wouldn't change that much this season. However, offensive coordinator David Yost has been cooking, uh, changing things up with uh, the play calling. And, and fun, funnily enough, it goes back to, to Keywan Jenkins, because like I said, he can be a runner, you know, he, he, yeah. he, he himself can, can, can burn defenders when he has to. So it, it's definitely going to be some experimentation during the non-conference schedule of, about what works best leading up to obviously taking on the rest of, of conference USA and seeing what works best. If it were up to you, who do you think is that first carry for a running back against Indiana? Lexington Joseph, uh, maybe partly just because of the story uh, that there is regarding his return due to injury. It's always great to see a player like him come back. He worked so hard to get back here. He was he was always positive, even when sidelined with that injury. You know, he was rooting for the rest of the running back room. So uh, definitely, just n- not just because of the story, but also but also to see just how ready he is to return to full time action for the FIU Panthers. But yeah, I. I it's tough not to say flex for that. All right, uh, moving over back to the, or moving back to the passing game. Yeah, uh, they did. They did suffer a huge loss when Conference USA All Conference First Team Chris Mitchell transferred to Notre Dame. Um, he was, you know, by far yeah. uh, the wide receiver one a year ago in terms of targets, receptions, yards, and even touchdowns. Um, but they do return guys like Dean Patterson and Eric Rivers, uh, yeah. and they bring they brought in some uh, some transfers as well. How did that unit look in the spring? It, they also looked fantastic, thankfully enough. Um, like you had mentioned, losing Chris Mitchell hurts because he was, without a doubt, your wide receiver one kind of wife. FIU has been kind of a wagon as far as as producing wide receiver talent. Before him, you had Tyrese Chambers, went on to Maryland, and obviously maybe the best FIU alum from football being T.Y. Hilton, who obviously went ahead and had a great career for the Colts. I think now he's with Dallas or maybe he's a free agent at this point. Uh, so that was the biggest question this off season, uh, this off season, in my opinion, is that who will sort of take Chris Mitchell's place, even if, or, or maybe they won't, maybe they won't even go with a real wide receiver one scenario where there's just going to be one guy who's going to take the majority of the snaps, like how it was last season. But regardless, um, it looks solid, especially because they did a great job recruiting and they, they did a great job signing some talent to this team. You had mentioned Dean Patterson, who I think will likely be the the wide receiver one but you also have players like desna washington on um, the transfer from new mexico who i think who's massive he is he, he looks to be a stud and can definitely um go and grab those uh, long balls because he's got the height and hands to do it so um that's going to be really fun to see obviously jenkins his connection last year was with chris mitchell and now he's going to have to find that next big connection so yeah it's going to be interesting interesting to see once again how that sort of develops who's going to be his number one passer as the season goes on. So obviously, you know, fall camp starts here and just under, I think like some camps open in like 10 days, the 24th, the majority, I think start the 29th, but, Mm -hmm. and and so a lot can change between now and week one against Indiana. Yeah. But if you, but if you had to pick who the wide receiver starters are week one, uh, who would you pick right now? So definitely um Dean Patterson. He's just that re- he's just that reliable kind of guy. Um, he he was Mr. Reliable last season, and I think he's going to be even better as he you know he enters as a redshirt junior with plenty of experience under his belt with the Panthers. As far as a wide receiver, too, you could go with either Eric Rivers or Juju Lewis, and I'd be okay. That probably Eric Rivers, just again, just again, because he has that experience. There's actually quite a bit of experience in that. Wide receiver room for the Panthers this year. Plenty of red shirt juniors all over, and that's great to see. Um, as far as the wide receiver three, like I said, I'd love to see what Desna Washington can bring to this team immediately just to see where he's at. I know he's a transfer, and he obviously has never taken a snap with FYU before, but I feel like he just meshes 
quite well with the rest of the team. So, um, so for my three starting receivers, I'd go Dean Patterson, um, um, Eric Rivers, and then Desna Washington. Awesome. All right. If you were to describe how the tight ends are utilized in this offense to someone who has never caught a game, how would you describe it? Blocking first, catching later. I mean, we we do have uh, the maybe the, one of the greatest names in college football, well, Rocky Beers. Two of the greatest names. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, Rowdy Beers is no longer with the team. Uh, okay. He actually left to pursue becoming a fighter fighter. So congratulations to him. We wish yeah, him absolutely. Best of luck with that. But we did. We we actually had Rocky Beers on our podcast not that long ago. He's super excited to get things going. But you know, he had mentioned it. Uh, the tight end room. They can sometimes be treated as extra offensive linemen to give Jenkins that time in the pocket, which is great to see because they still because he had great numbers throwing to players like Chris Mitchell, who got a thousand yards. It doesn't happen a lot for FIU football having a thousand yard receivers. But yeah, I feel like tight ends aren't used quite that often. But if if FIU wants to adopt a heavy tight end usage, Rocky Beers could be that guy. You also have Josiah Miaman. Uh, a senior on the team. He's got experience as well. But that one-two tandem between Miaman and Rocky could be pretty cool to see if they really want to utilize them more towards the passing game. But I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean it seemed like it, it seemed it seemed like last year maybe it was a game by game basis, right? Yeah. Where they, they would get a lot of work in the passing game one game and then maybe be quiet for a couple games and then get a lot of work again. But yeah. Yeah. The Rocky caught the first touchdown of any tight end for FIU football last season in the finale against Western Kentucky. Uh, that was the first touchdown for the tight end group. So if that doesn't yeah. show you how they were utilized, I don't know what will. Yeah, I think I actually had that touchdown catch in the Yeah, uh, you had it too. It was a crazy video. play. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it was, it was an insane play. But, yeah, uh, if they do want to utilize tight ends more in the passing game, Rocky might be that guy. All right, uh, moving over to the offensive line. They look to be in pretty good shape here in 2024. Yep. Um, Conference USA, all-conference first-teamer Philip Houston. Um, their right tackle from a year ago, they did lose him. He transferred to Colorado, but right. they bring back the rest of this line, um, and that has to be a good feeling for fans and even even uh, more so for Kawan Jenkins. Um, how, how did the offensive line look in the spring? They looked solid. However, during in that spring showcase, they definitely had some hiccups here and there that could be attributed to a very hungry defensive line that um, FIU ha might have, which is, again, exciting to see. But, yeah, the offensive line has had their hiccups here and there and is obviously, I'd say, the biggest concern of the offense in general, just if they can stay healthy and if they can be as reliable as they can be. But, you no, know, there are some exciting players um, there. Unfortunately, one of our – I'd say one of our better linemen, John Bach, is, is suspended for the first part of the season – um, with that said, you could see a player like Jadarius Lee. Uh, he can play anywhere on the line. He's been the talk of the town against uh, with the coaching staff. A, a guy like him, very exciting to see what he can deliver to this team. And obviously, I think that one of the best aspects of an offensive lineman, um, aside from just being a natural talent, is to have longevity. If you can play a whole season without something bad happening to you. And that had, unfortunately, FIU has not had a great track record with that as many other G5 teams across the nation. So, um, a lot of questions still with that part of the offense, but overall there are some key players that fans should be excited about. Yeah, I always feel like uh, spring games, the the offensive line and the defensive line are kind of the, the hardest to really get a feel for because, yeah. you know, like is it is it the defensive line is really good or the offensive line is bad or or vice versa? You know, it's, it's yeah. been, I find it very hard to get a read on, on in the trenches there in, in spring for sure. And like and, and obviously some of the best games for FIU offensively, like I alluded to, their games against uh, the UConn Huskies and North Texas Mean Green down the line. That game against Sam Houston State that went to double overtime. That was an exciting game. But those games, the offensive lines performed particularly well. Jenkins wasn't pressured as much as he was in other games. So yeah, that definitely obviously uh, in any level of football, the offensive line being reliable and being there uninjured goes a long way as far as to what the quarterback can do. All right, if you have to pick an offensive player to have a breakout type season here in 2024, who are you picking? It would be easy to say Kiwan Jenkins because this is his year to shine. Um, obviously, a lot of he's gone through trials and tribulations. Like I said, um, he was sort of brought in there um, out of the blue in the second week of the season. Um, but not to mention, we had spoken with the um, uh, uh, offensive coordinator, David Yost, and one of the things that he did – 
during this offseason is watch more film of Jenkins in high school and, and what he was able to do there when he won a billion awards in Miami Central as one of the powerhouses uh, of high school football in South Florida, which, is, as I'm sure you know, is an absolute hot spot for, for young talent all over the nation. So he, he's looked a lot into that to see what will really work with Jenkins. So the easy answer would be that Lights is going to have a, an absolutely amazing season, provided everything works out for him, that you have players like Patterson who are who can be just as reliable as they were last season, that the offensive line um, um, a blocks for him well, and that he has a solid running room to back him up against the defenses that really particularly go against um, the quarterbacks. As far as an offensive weapon, um. There's so much talent in the running back room between um, Lawrence Owens and Flex that it, it doesn't feel safe picking one of them. Dean Patterson could be great if Jenkins is great because I feel like that's likely the guy he's going to be throwing to a lot. So de facto, um, Patterson could have another could have an amazing season. Awesome. Well, let's uh, move over to the defensive side of the ball. Last season, the Panthers seemed to struggle to generate mm-hmm. much pressure on opposing quarterbacks. Um, did you see anything in the spring that would that led, led you to believe maybe they uh, they got a plan to getting more pressure on those quarterbacks here in 2024? Definitely, that was one of the most highlighted as negatives of last season for this FIU team. We had, we had Mike McIntyre on the show not that long ago. He had alluded to it. Not to mention talks with uh, the defensive coordinator Javon Dewitt. Um, he had noted about it. They need to find success when pressuring the quarterback, and that was something that we saw in that spring showcase, three sacks um, on FIU's quarterbacks um, during that time. So, uh, yeah, the offensive line has gotten better for FIU football, but definitely maintaining a solid defensive front, and obviously um, the linebackers in second. The linebackers, I feel like, are going to be some of the best aspects of FIU football this season. So, yeah, no, definitely uh, the defense was – at, at points suspect last year and it's definitely a big aspect of how FIU has tried to improve in the uh, in the spring uh with with signings. So let's let's get to the personnel that make up that defense. So you have to start up front. So let's talk about the guys along this defensive line. Right. Uh, the the line will be young in in 2024. They lost some guys to the portal. Mm-hmm. Um Conference USA first team all conference defensive tackle Jordan Garrard transferred yep. to Louisville. Um, they lose Jack Daly, who graduated, which yeah. leaves Jeremy Passmore, who was second on the team in last last sacks last year, as the guy for this defensive line. Um, how did the defensive line look in the spring, and who do you feel needs to step up the most for them? They looked really good. I'm I'm happy to say. And you had mentioned Jeremy Passmore. He is the I think the standout guy right now on that defensive line. A redshirt senior. He, he is. This is obviously his last his last season to shine. With the Panthers, um, if if I were to give a, a player who I think could absolutely break out and have a great season, look to Giovanni Davis, a senior from South Florida, transfer from UT Martin. Uh, he is uh, as far as as far as ability and flexibility all across all parts of the defensive line. He is a very exciting player to look out for. Uh, I'd say G- between a newcomer like Giovanni Davis and uh, and the leader of the defensive line specifically, which I would say is Jeremy Passmore. Those are two players to keep an eye out. All right. Uh, let's move over to the linebacking group. Um, they do lose their leading tackler from a year ago and Donovan Manuel. And they mm-hmm. also lost uh, Alex Nobles to graduation, but yeah. the room is highlighted by the return of their second leading tackler, Reggie Peterson, and also Elijah Anderson Taylor. How did the linebackers look in the spring and did anyone stand out? Yeah, so Donovan Manuel, he uh, signed as an undrafted free agent with the Minnesota Vikings, so we wish the uh, very best of luck to him in his NFL career. I think Reggie Peterson is the best player on FIU football, bar none. Um, he He is beyond talented. He himself received mentorship from Donovan Manuel last season when they were playing together. I feel very excited that Reggie is going to be not just the leader of the defense, but one of the captains on this FIU team. That has the biggest breakthrough this year. He was a monster last year, and I feel like he he's honed his skills more, even better, especially in a um, in, in a defensive room that is that has seen new new coaches added to the uh, defense in general, and some experience here and there. But I feel like definitely, if there was one player you had to highlight from 
FIU football that could make say first team all conference USA, it's gonna be um um it's gonna be him. It's uh it's very and I, I'm not just saying that because we actually had him on our podcast not that long ago and he's, he's a good player. Our, he you know he's a great player. He was a super fun guy to talk to, but no Reggie Peterson in his senior season, I think he's going to have a monster a monster year with this team. So last year you kind of had a, a Batman and Robin uh, duo, if you will, with Manuel yeah. and Peterson. And so, you know, with, with Manuel moving on, is has anybody stepped up to kind of be the Robin to uh, Peterson's Batman? Whew. I mean, yeah, man. Um, I, I, I Again, linebacker room, the the entire linebacker room, I think, has absolutely an amazing level of talent. I feel like you could look to Elijah Anderson Taylor as well as Travion Barnes, the juniors and redshirt seniors that make up this team. To be the uh, to be the guys that can take over, uh, yeah. But no, I, I think it's going to be the Reggie Peterson show, number one, and then whoever follows again, whoever follows up with him, will also have an amazing uh, season as well, just because of what Reggie himself can do. Because he he he's a, he's a leader. He has proved himself that he can be a leader on that defense, command the field, and um, yeah, whoever ends up being his Robin, whether it's I think it could be a player like Elijah Anderson Taylor or or Travion Bards among others, yeah. Well, uh, I'm excited to see that. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's move over to the defensive backfield. They lose Adrian Cole to Arkansas State, yeah. uh, but probably the biggest loss was Deverick Daniel, who graduated. Right. He was third third on the team in tackles. Um, he kind of played that I don't know. I would call it a hybrid position. Um, mm-hmm. Like I, I, I think they call it banded, but to me, it's like a linebacker slash safety hybrid. Um, but despite those losses, the room looks like it's in pretty good shape. What do you yeah. think we should we should expect from these guys in 2024? Ooh, um, yeah, a lot of talent there in the defensive back. I feel like you could be looking at a player like JoJo Evans to become the leader of that group. You also have players like Jamal Potts and Hezekiah Masters. Um, I, I feel I feel really confident in that of Brian Blades, who could have another amazing season with FIU. But no, there were some games last season where uh, against some of the better um, offenses in Conference USA, like Liberty and Western Kentucky where the secondary did not have amazing games per se, and they ended up being blowouts, which sucks. But, no, I feel like when you combine a bit of experience with um, some of the uh, returners that this team has, um, definitely look out for players like Brian Blades and JoJo Evans. CJ Christian as well could have an amazing season. Antonio Patterson. Just every defensive back that we have um, could uh, turn out to be the leader of this team and have an amazing season. So uh, it's a it's a nice room overall. Is there was there any one that you felt like kind of might have stepped up and might take that role vacated by Daniel, or do you mm. think that's still kind of be determined in fall camp? I would say to be determined. Um, it, 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 again, it, it's tough to say because it's a very well balanced room. But some of the bigger names like Hezekiah Masses, Antonio Patterson, JoJo, and and, and Brian Blades. They could all be that kind of guy. It, it, it's going to be a fun competition to see who will be the um, the starters come Indiana. Uh, but I do feel think it's yet to be determined. All right. If you had to pick a defensive player to have a breakout type season in 2024, who are you going to pick? Reggie Peterson. Absolutely. I, I think, he, like I said, I think he's going to be first team all conference USA and just make some waves throughout the entire F entire G5 landscape. I think he's going to have an amazing year. Absolutely. I think I think he potentially could be one of the top tacklers uh, in, in all the college football for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, with spring practice now over, um, you, you mentioned the offensive line, but, you know, which position group or groups do you feel is the most concerning? Aside from the offensive line, I feel I think you could also look at the defensive line as well, ironically, just because of um what players will really step up and, and and on both sides of the ball just either a protect the quarterback or be go against or go against the quarterback i feel like that's still to be determined on both sides of the ball so both both lines offense and defense not completely um not not completely uh, aligned with in my opinion but uh, again uh, the, the fall can prove a lot absolutely um you know i'm not sure of the florida international scholarship situation do you think there's, you know, they are they looking to add anyone in the portal still, or and if they are, what position in particular, or do you think they're pretty much set? I would say from what we've seen, they look pretty much set, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if like I said, they want to go 
and look oh, look to see who's still available in the transfer portal or to just even see some other signings from the high school level that are still exciting just to prepare themselves for the future because like I said when you have a, when you have a system as as insane as as high school football in Miami is for producing talent you always have to keep a sharp eye out you know so Absolutely. Uh, yeah no I I would say the transfers they've gotten all look really good it's going to be interesting to see who else they bring in and how they'll mesh with some of the signings they already have. Not to mention for a lot of positions on this team, the uh, experience and returning players that FIU has already. What would you say is the main strength of this team? Uh, aside from the linebacker room, just because you have that, you have Reggie there. I would say the receiver core, just because you I, once again you have so many reliable pieces there. Um, not to mention you have a great quarterback like Kewan Jenkins throwing them the ball to. Um, that's going to be exciting. As far as the quarterback room itself, it, it, it's also fun because you have a player like Kewan Jenkins with really high expectations, and like I mentioned earlier, I think he's going to deliver on a lot of them. So um, with that said, uh, yeah, I'd say look out for the wide receiver room, the linebackers. And if Jenkins breaks out, the quarterback room is going to be a fun talk as well. When it uh, when it comes to the recruitment of new players and the retention of existing players, how has NIL and the transfer portal impacted Florida International? Both good and bad. Um, yeah, good and bad because, yeah, we, we, we lost a lot of players to the transfer portal. And, and the biggest player, as we mentioned at the start, was Chris Mitchell who went to Notre Dame. So it's tough. Yeah, it, 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 it's tough. But um, head coach Mike McIntyre has, I mean, this is his third year with the program. And after back-to-back four and eight seasons, he himself is looking for, you know, something better for this FIU team. And this, I feel like this this season specifically is the season where the majority of the players and even the coaching staff has been to his likely, to, or to his liking more than any other year since he was sort of thrusted into the um, – into the head coaching job here for the Panthers. So there's been some good. There's been some bad. We we do have a, a, a collective here at FIU called the Blueprint Collective, which is looked, which has signed a bunch of football players to it. And um, obviously having cool things like the Vice jerseys, the Lamborghinis parked um, uh, <laughs> parked behind, parked at the game dur- during Vice Night, all that cool stuff helps out as well. Not to mention the fact that, you know, it's Miami. It's the 305. Yeah. You get to play football here in South Florida, you know, where dreams are made, um, actual Miami, you know, not, not, not like that team that calls themselves Miami, but plays actually in Coral Gables, you know? (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) yeah. All right. Uh, it seems more and more that the demands of the head coach are really turning into more of a general manager type role, you know, between, between recruiting freshmen, um, retaining your own roster, uh, recruiting, you know, from the portal, and then you add fundraising on top of all that. And sometimes yes. maybe they're less involved in the X's and O's. Do you kind of see that happening there with uh, Coach McIntyre? Or is he kind of trying to be the jack of all trades, so to speak? I think there were. I think FIU has a really great recruiting sort of staff that goes alongside Mike McIntyre. And then they've made it a point not just to scour for talent over South Florida, which is massive, but also just on a, on a uh, national scale. So no, I think definitely um, Mike McIntyre has done a great job sort of maintaining his status as, as the the sheriff in the coaching staff and, and, and overlooking what the offense and defense can deliver. However, there's no hiding it. This is going to be a make or break season for Mike McIntyre as well. Uh, There's going to be a lot decided on how well this team does. If they go four and eight for a third straight season, I don't know if that's going to cut it for the FIU Panthers. Granted, Mike McIntyre was was that named the head coach of a team that prior to his arrival had won a single game in two seasons. That single game was against an FCS opponent. Uh, they went one and eleven in 2019, and then 2020 they went zero and five. The majority of their games are canceled anyway because of the uh, pandemic. So it's been rough for him to suddenly turn FIU into a into a bowl eligible team, but definitely last season there were some woulda coulda shoulda games where you could have gotten to your fifth or even sixth wins. Now I feel like the bar has been set to at least you know we we want to see some sort of progress. If that means a fifth win, there's some hope for the future, or a sixth win to get you into a bowl game, which FIU has not been in since 2019. 
yeah, the bar has been set high for Mike McIntyre, and I'm very hopeful that he'll deliver, or, or, or I, I hope that he will deliver. So is that, is that, you know, if I was to ask you what success looks like there in 2024, is is the bare minimum a bowl game here? Yeah, I'd say the uh, bare minimum is to get into a bowl game, to prove that FIU in in the world of FBS belongs in, 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 in FBS, that they can do more than be a perennial four and eight, five and five team. Um, these la- it's still it's still a bit disappointing that these last two seasons of four and eight have been leagues better than what has come before it for these last few years. That the best memory I've had I, I had while being a student at FIU was seeing them be the University of Miami back in 2019 at Marlin Spark. I think, you, I think you also had a clip for that game in that montage as well. And not that they lost to Arkansas State in the Camellia Bowl that same season. So we just want to see some sort of success. Uh, I feel like there'd be even some fans, maybe even myself included, that would be happy with the season if they were to beat Florida Atlantic, their big rival, the FAU Owls in the Shula Bowl. You know, they were they when they left to join the the AAC, that rivalry, that yearly rivalry between the Panthers and the Owls stopped last season for the first time, which was weird. I'm happy they're bringing that back in the form of a non-conference opponent, but uh, we haven't beaten FAU in a very long time. It's 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 tough to say it's a rivalry when you're being dominated by the Owls as much as the Panthers have been in recent memory. So to see them walk into Boca Raton and beat FAU would also be a great milestone for this season, aside from getting into a bowl game. All right. So, well, we, we've kind of covered a lot of ground today on the Panthers, but is there anything else you want to share or think that we should know about this 2024 Florida International Panthers football team? I would say that schedule wise, and I, I actually, I do quite like FIU football schedule aside from Indiana at the start, the rest of their non-con is kind of favorable. You have central Michigan from the Mac, like I mentioned, FAU, which will be a test for FIU early and then Monmouth, as their FCS opponent. Um, I, I, I am actually entering this season with a bit of excitement and confidence, which, like I said, is kind of hard to come by as an F as an FIU football fan in the past half decade. So um, I, I do actually feel really confident that FIU can get into a bowl game and just actually look really good um, on both sides of the ball, on both offense and defense. There are some great name players here on this team that even NFL scouts should look forward to come the end of the season. And I feel that, um, yeah, the FIU faithful are, uh, they're hungry to uh, see a great season from FIU. And if it's not this season, it's going to be tough to determine when that will happen. Well, we'll we'll certainly be rooting for you. And like I said, I hope you guys get a big win uh, week one against the, uh, the P4 opponent in Indiana. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Obviously, Indiana themselves uh, looking like a brand new squad from top to bottom. So who knows? You know, who knows? Who knows? Mike McIntyre and the boys feel confident that they can go in there and get it done. So we're hopeful. We're praying. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jake, uh, thank you again for taking time out of your day to spend with us and uh, share your knowledge. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening in podcast form, please rate and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thank you all for your support. And until the next time, we are the G5 Hive. Pause.